Welcome to everyone, those of you who are joining from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, from across the US and from other countries around the world. And I wanna give a particularly warm welcome to our distinguished panelists today, Colin Harvey, Sarah Creighton and Claire Hackett. My name is Leah Wing and I'm a faculty member in the Legal Studies Program in the Political Science Department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I am the director of the Art of Conflict Transformation event series, which is hosting this panel today on a referendum on a united Ireland. Today's panelists are leading public figures in academia, journalism, and the community sector, and they're going to be sharing their insights about the implications of the yet unexercised mechanism within the Belfast Good Friday Agreement for a referendum on a united Ireland over what some would call the reunification of the island of Ireland. The successes and struggles over the implementation of this peace accord and its successor agreements, <clears throat> the impact of Brexit, and the significant demographic shifts that have taken place over the last 25 years have created a context in which there's a growing momentum for and debate about holding a referendum or what is locally often referred to as a border poll. We hope that today's panel will serve as a contribution to the public engagement on this important topic. I look forward, as I know you do, to hearing from our panel. So without further ado, let me introduce each of the members. Colin Harvey is Professor of Human Rights Law and Director of the Human Rights Center in the School of Law at Queen's University, Belfast. He is a fellow of the Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, and an associate fellow of the Institute of Irish Studies. Sarah Creighton writes in her own voice, I work full time for a housing charity in Northern Ireland. I'm a writer for Slugger O'Toole and have been published in the Belfast Telegraph and The Guardian. I also do television, radio, and have appeared on BBC and Channel 4. I write about social issues and Northern Irish politics. I'm le a left-wing feminist and I would support Northern Ireland remaining part of the UK. Our next panelist is Claire Hackett and she will be joining today as both a participant and the moderator. Claire is manager of the Peace Building and Good Relations team at Falls Community Council. She's founding director of the Dukas Oral History Archive and has worked with communities across Belfast to gather their experiences of living through the conflict. She coordinated the publication, Living Through the Conflict, Belfast Oral Histories in 2014. And she has developed work on gender and dealing with the legacy of the past. She co-directed the documentary, A Kind of Sisterhood with Michelle Devlin. She is a member of the Board of Directors for Healing Through Remembering, Relatives for Justice, and Falsha Ferst Affair. I want to invite all, our panel in, in its entirety, invite all the participants to feel comfortable adding comments and questions throughout the talk today. And there will be an opportunity for the panelists to engage with their comments and questions. So everyone welcome, and I now turn it over to Claire. Thank you so much, Leah. And it is just great to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, really looking forward to this uh, discussion and talk and for all the comments and questions that you're going to put in and we'll respond to. So tonight we're going to reflect on the part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that grappled with the constitutional issue at the core of the conflict. The agreement didn't resolve this issue, but it framed it in a particular way using the principles of consent and self-determination and setting out a process for going forward. So before we start, and I have my opening questions for uh, Sarah and Colin, I want to read out just for the audience, um, just three paragraphs from the agreement. Just, I mean, there's there's a much longer session section on the, uh, the constitutional issues, but these three paragraphs, I think just kind of encapsulate what it says, and it's worth reminding ourselves what it says. So, it is for the people of the island of Ireland alone, by agreement between the two parts, respectively, and without external impediment, to exercise their right of self-determination on the basis of consent, 
freely and concurrently given North and South to bring about a united Ireland, if that is their wish, accepting that this right must be achieved and exercised with and subject to the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. If in the future, the people of the island of Ireland exercise their right of self-determination to bring about a united Ireland, it will be a binding obligation on both governments to introduce and support in their respective parliaments legislation to give effect to that wish. Northern Ireland in its entirety remains part of the United Kingdom and shall not cease to be so without the consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland voting in a poll. The Secretary of State may direct the holding of a poll and shall exercise the power if at any time it appears likely to him that a majority of those voting would express a wish that Northern Ireland should cease to be part of the United Kingdom and form part of the United Ireland. So that gives you something of the craft that uh, was in the agreement. It is in the agreement. And then also a sense of uh, what a process might be going forward, but also, I suppose, leaves many questions. So, Colin, Sarah, Colin, you first. Um, it's the same question really for you both to kick us off. What do you think the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement achieved in terms of dealing with the constitutional issue? Well, thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Leah, for the invitation to participate and discuss and think about these issues as everybody's thinking about the agreement at the moment. I really want to start by expressing my respect for the work that Sarah does uh, and admiration for the work that Sarah does and that she's been doing for a very, very long time. I think she's an absolutely essential voice in this debate and I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this evening with Sarah, but, but with everyone. In terms of the agreement, and you've read out the, the, the sections, I think ultimately it's a significant constitutional compromise. And I want to put the emphasis tonight on the compromise element of it, and I'll explain why. I think what the agreement achieved really was broad buy-in to that constitutional co compromise and the formula that you've set out as part of a, an overall agreement. It's important politically, right? So it's a multi-party agreement, but it's also important legally, you know, also binding international law and British Irish agreement, and also being given effect in domestic law in various ways. So it's, when we're talking about the agreement, we're talking about politics and we're talking about law as well. It's been democratically endorsed and we're sitting between two important dates, a lot of focus on the 10th of April, but in many ways, I think the 22nd of May is a more interesting date. That's when the people across the island of Ireland were given the opportunity to decide and really endorsed it overwhelmingly. So politics, law, democratic endorsement. When you read, you know, books like David Donahue's book, it's, it's fairly clear from an insider's perspective anyway, the extent to which the constitutional issues section was negotiated between both governments and the text was prefigured by intergovernmental discussions but also other conversations as well. For example, you know, evolving private and public discussions that were happening within republicanism and nationalism from around the mid 1980s onwards. So I've put an emphasis on compromise because I think it's easy to forget, particularly at the moment, the extent to which the agreement and the formula is a compromise for republicans and nationalism and quite a significant one at that. And I think then and since, and it was mentioned a few times in recent weeks, the, the reaction of political unionism then and now to multiple agreements, often an overreaction, I think sometimes obscures in an objective sense what was actually agreed. What I mean by that is that what the agreement does, and it's not acknowledged enough, it secured nationalist and Republican participation in governance arrangements. And ultimately, if you want to put it like this, the acceptance of a dilution of traditional Republican notions of Irish self-determination. So what am I say what am I saying? Well, I'm really starting by by, by framing this in a, in a different way. 
the agreement was a big constitutional compromise. Unionism, when you stand back and analyze it objectively, achieved many of its objectives through the Good Friday Agreement. So the constitutional future then is an open question. And we can bore you all to the tears. It's you know past nine o'clock here, send you all to sleep with the legalism. I'm not going to do that. But essentially, it's about choice. People of Northern Ireland, the North, whatever you want to call it, have a choice about the constitutional future. And my hope would be on either side of that argument that people will spend more time thinking about persuasive arguments uh, and hopeful arguments and less time trying to fill the other side with fear, anxiety and worry. So um, that's the way I want to frame it. I think that's what it's achieved, a sort of buy into a compromise. And I want to end with a slightly troubling note. And the worry is uh, the current government in London is hinting, suggesting and in, in attempts to coax the DUP uh, back into government of of tinkering, messing around, of of opening up that constitutional compromise. And that worries me tremendously because uh, this society has multiple challenges and problems. And I think the absolute last thing we need at the moment is for that constitutional issue section of the Good Friday Agreement to be opened up. So thank you very much again for the invitation. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So you've raised so many points there. Colin, I'm scribbling down things that we need to come back to. Um, but Sarah, let's hear from you about what you think was achieved by what Colin is calling the constitutional compromise. What way would you think of it? Thank you, Claire, and, and thank you very much, Leah, as well, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much to Colin for his very kind words. Um, when I was studying law at Queen's, Colin was one of the professors at Queen's. So for him to say that about me, I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, and equally, just you know, I, I dis Colin and I disagree about about things in the in this issue, but I've, I have a lot of admiration for Colin as well. And um, he speaks very proudly about what he believes, and and he gets he's had unwarranted harassment for what he said, and it's absolutely disgraceful. Um, for me, yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, it was a constitutional compromise. I think um, the debate really has always been whether it was a, a settlement or whether it was something else. Um, some unionists would see it as being a settlement that, that that it created certain conditions around Northern Ireland and everything was was sorted and that was it. Um, whereas I think some nationalists and Republicans would see it as like a process towards Irish unity, that type of thing. But but I, I do think Colin is right. It was a compromise. Um, certainly for for unionists they did win quite significant wins which you wouldn't know <laughs> from listening to some of them you wouldn't know that that was the case um you know the good friday agreement it states you know that a majority of people in northern ireland at, in 1998 and of course this was said it said a majority of people in northern in northern ireland want to remain part of the united kingdom you know it legitimizes my view northern ireland's existence within the union by consent um and then for unionists as well they would see I mean, that was a huge compromise for nationalists and Republicans. And as, as Colin says, considering their core principles, um, that was a huge compromise for them. Um, for unionists, they would say it was a compromise because they they agreed that Northern Ireland could be taken out of the union by consent. Um, for me, you know, I, I think really it posed a challenge really for everybody in Northern Ireland. And it, what they said, the government, the two governments said really was, if you want the United Ireland, if you want to remain in the union, you're going to have to convince people to to your position really you know that the the, the the onus is on you now it's not going to happen by violence it's not going to happen by um sectarian head count you know it's going to be because the people of northern ireland want to remain in the union if they want to join united ireland, it's because they want to join it's not going to happen um you know at the at the end of a barrel of a gun um and i think that was really important thing you know i think it really posed a challenge for both communities at that stage to, to really try and win people over um I don't think we've done a great job. <laughs> don't think anybody's really done a great job at this point um, after the over the past 25 years of doing that. Um, but it really was um, a huge compromise in that sense. And, and Northern Ireland's place in the union really does depend on the will of the people, really. Um, and I think for that reason, really, for I think for the younger generation, it's really interesting because, you know, I was born in 1987. I remember the tail end of the Troubles, but I didn't really grow up with it. You know, it's kind of a very blurry memory for me. Um, but for my younger siblings, you know, they have absolutely no memory of it whatsoever. They, you know, they were born in 2001. You know, they they don't have, certainly I can't really speak from my perspective. And, and I obviously, I come from a 
a Protestant middle class background, so I understand that this does not apply to everyone. But for for some people in Northern Ireland, you know, my parents and my grandparents had baggage from the troubles from having lived through that, from having experienced that. And, you know, for many people, you know, United Ireland was tied up with the provisional IRA in the same way that the union for a lot of people means, you know, the gerrymandering and, and the, the unionist government of, of the 1920s onwards. Um, but for them, the, the Good Friday Agreement took violence out of the situation and has allowed, I think, the younger generation on either side really to come at this from a very, very different perspective and to think about this on their own terms, really, you know, for, for my younger siblings, you know, um, they would, I mean, to be honest, very few of them would actually call themselves a unionist, you know, they're either for United Ireland or they are persuadable, really, um, indifference is, is a big thing as well, some of them just want absolutely nothing to do with politics in Northern Ireland. But I think for some people in the younger generation, and, and I say that because for some, a lot of young people, you know, the troubles really, the violence may have ended, but they're still living with the legacy of the troubles. And I think it's important to remember that. But I do think for some young people in Northern Ireland, um, really, particularly I think for some unionists, um, the Good Friday Agreement was the moment where they detached themselves from unionism also. You know, I think for, for my parents and grandparents' generation, they felt an obligation to vote unionist to be pro-union. They were pro-union because of the circumstances at the time. And I think for some people, the Good Friday Agreement allowed them to go, right, well, that's that's done. I can kind of choose my own path, really, which which I find really, really interesting. So, yeah, I think it was a it was a constitutional compromise. And I think really, as I said, the onus is really on whatever your your point of view is on this. Really, we, we have to win people over. You know, you have to convince people that your argument is the best. It won't be done by by the by by how we did it in the past, essentially. And I think that's a good thing. Again, raising really fascinating points there, and there's something about um, what you're both saying as about how the Good Friday Agreement, as well as being that compromise, um, also did gesture towards how we manage this and how we go forward uh, around this issue. But at the same time, even though that was, I can remember thinking, even though that was there in the agreement, um. It wasn't something that was really talked about. That part of the agreement wasn't talked about really for many years. Um, and one of the things that actually, you know, galvanized that forward was Brexit. And I know we'll come back to that. But um, so you've both kind of reflected on, on, you know, what was achieved there. What do you see are, are the limitations then? And I'm talking here about the text, what's actually in the Good Friday Agreement. So this language of compromise uh, was set out, the two different kind of principles of consent and self-determination, but also kind of saying, well, look, you know, persuasion is needed, as, you're, as you've uh, both been saying, um, but also here, here's the pathway, here is the way going forward. Is there any, and I know I've heard you talk about this a number of times, Colin, about what's not in the agreement, and therefore that's what leaves things in a sense, um, perhaps, you know, too unclear for the situation we're facing at the minute? It's, it's a really good good question, you know, in terms of, I suppose that the process questions and, and puzzles in the text of the agreement are really, really well known and they've been given a lot of thought. I see one of the intriguing aspects of recent years, just the amount of work that's been done trying to think about process questions, you know, the UCL project and other things that have happened are in really, really technical questions about how you get there. I suppose an interesting point for me is that how you get a referendum here, how, 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 how that actually happens. And I think the testing point for that is really going to come when there's more intense mobilization around a referendum happening. Now that 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 can either be because of polling evidence, you know, if you had some of the polling evidence that they had in Scotland for a reasonably long time up until recently, could be electoral trends or other factors. You know, a, a new Irish government may be knocking on the door in London saying we'd like this on the agenda of the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference. So the question would be, what happens if the UK government, as has been done in Scotland, says no and keeps saying no? Um. So in other words, you know, how do you get a referendum? Um, I think an Irish government being proactive 
might make a difference, but I think that's still, and, it, and people, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, the, what you need, polling evidence, electoral evidence, other evidence and all that. But what happens even when you get all that evidence and, and the, you know, Westminster government still is not entirely convinced it is an interesting one. And I think that's where politics will, tr you know, overtake law, Trump law, if you think in, in that. Um, I think establishing the legitimacy of the conversation is still a challenge. Right. You know, I start from a really boring legalistic point. You know, if it says something in a text and people have made you a textual promise, you sort of take it seriously. But it's just it's still not the case. It's it's still hard for the conversation to be treated as equally legitimate, I think. And here I'm, I'm going to focus in on not where people think I might focus in on political unionism. I'm going to focus in the south of the island because let me put it like this. Who could really blame Northern Nationalists and Republicans in the midst of the absolute shambolic mess of Brexit for pointing out the fact that Northern Ireland, the North, had an automatic re-entry option to the European Union in the midst of all that? Who could really blame people for pointing that out? But some of the most sceptical voices around that, yes, there were political unionist voices, but they were coming from the South of Ireland, who firm you know, firm steer to pipe down, uh, saying that raising that issue was divisive, unhelpful, inflammatory. I heard a very prominent figure refer to raising it as pouring petrol on, on the fire. That wasn't coming from unionism. That was coming from establishment Ireland. Uh, many of those figures will, will come up here and talk about the Good Friday Agreement and how important it is. So, you know, the issue of establishing the legitimacy of the discussion seems to me really a big challenge still. Because let me put it like this, right? How do you seriously expect any British government or any British political party to take this seriously? If the Irish government doesn't. You know, how, how do you expect the British government to talk about this in a mature way? If the Irish government won't. <laughs> if the Irish government would prefer to use euphemisms and talk about uh, the language and the, the agreement. So again, just to, you know, put that out there uh, this evening. So can you really blame unionism? Is it, you know, establishment Ireland, let me use a slightly provocative terminology, uh, implies that there's something illegitimate about it in the way that it addresses it. So, you know, so th that needs to change. I think it is changing. It will change. And maybe it will take governmental change in Ireland for really to change fundamentally. But I want to put that out there as a as a as a problem and a challenge for operationalizing all this. Um, I suppose just to make clear um, to um, those in our audience, especially our US audience, who won't be familiar with this, Sarah, Colin, myself, we are very familiar with this issue of um, being even raising the issue of a referendum or a process for a referendum is seen to be, as Colin has said, divisive. And, very, and many figures, you know, across the island and uh, both islands, in fact, would see it as divisive. And I think that would be a surprise for many people in our audience, Colin, because of what I have read out from the agreement, which it may feel to some people, oh, surely you've been talking about this more or less <laughs> since the agreement was signed. Um, but no, it, it certainly was the case. Um, that whenever people started talking more strongly about it, particularly with Brexit, that um, there was a chorus of voices, you know, from uh, different political parties across the island who were saying, no, don't do this now. Um, Sarah, you would have been aware of that as well. But I mean, answer that point if you want. But just also to say, you know, reflect on that. What, what you know, you've said what was good about um, how the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Good Friday Agreement addressed this issue or what was um, helpful. Um, but what do you think is not helpful that's in the agreement or are there absences there or, you know, what are the limitations of what's in the agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think on the divisive point, um it's a it's a yeah, I I, I get my find myself frustrated with this as well. I, I definitely think that some unionists, not all, but would would treat the discussion of United Ireland questions being illegitimate, and I, which I don't get because, you know, at the moment unionists are talking a lot about the Northern Ireland Protocol, and the reason why they feel passionately about the Northern Ireland Protocol is because 
it's about the union, right? You know, so that's them talking about their constitutional aspirations. I don't see how, if if that's acceptable, then Nationalist Republicans should be able to talk about United Ireland, you know. But I, obviously, though, I do, you know, I I get why sometimes, you know, I do get frustrated when either issue the union and United Ireland will often be brought up in discussion when sometimes it's just you're like, can we just not go there? <laughs> it depends what it is. You know, I think there, there, there's there's a time and a place for it, but I, I, I absolutely get what Colin is saying about, I, I get frustrated about that as well. You know, they'll say, why are they having, you know, this this discussion about United Ireland? Because it's because they're allowed to, be, you know what I mean? It's absolutely fine. They don't need to ask permission to do that. Um, but yeah, and that I would agree with 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 Colin, you know, about it with the le- in the legal text of the agreement. Um, you know, they talk about, you know, a border poll should be held when it's you know Ireland looks likely, and what what is likely is very open ended. The courts have looked at this. The courts have had a go, maybe at saying what they think it would mean, but ultimately it's up to the Secretary of State really to say what that means. And um, there are, I think, the big problem with the agreement is, you know, it, it's quite vague in parts. People have different ideas about what actually it means in practice. So, you know, it talks about rigorous impartiality that that, that the state needs to have. Um, people think that applies to my understanding is that applies just to the to how it manages a border poll. Some people think that applies across the board in Northern Ireland. Um, so you know when the DEP did the deal with the Tory government, it was a confidence and supply agreement. You know some people said that broke the Good Friday Agreement. I don't think it did. Um, I, I think the vagueness of the agreement is one of its biggest one of its many failures because I think it, it we can't agree on what it means, so we we end up we've used it kind of as a weapon in some cases. I think it's been weaponized. We kind of just hit each other around the head of it and say, you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And really what it says in the text is completely open to the interpretation. I mean, that was probably deliberately done. I think, you know, because everybody had to come away from the agreement with something, didn't they? You know, everybody had to sell different parts of it. Um, but I think to generally, you know, with the frustrations I have with the agreement are, I, I do think it entrenches division. You know, I'm not one of these people that believes there's a kind of attitude in some parts of Northern Ireland that to be unionist or nationalist or Republican is that you are sectarian. We were, we were talking about this earlier that, you know, it's almost particularly among the middle class and I am middle class. You know, you would get this attitude of being, oh, that's that's not for us. That's impolite or, you know, I, I don't believe that at all. I, I, I think people are perfectly entitled to those opinions and British and Irish identities are legitimate. Um, but I do think the agreement it, I don't think it has helped foster reconciliation. I don't. I think it has entrenched identities. I think we're still most people in Northern Ireland really do vote for unionist and nationalist parties. Again, fine, but I don't think we talk about the rise of the middle ground. That's a whole other topic. So these are you know people in Northern Ireland who would identify as neither unionist or nationalist and really would see themselves outside that. I think that's great, but. I don't think in terms of actually reconciling together, working together, living together, I don't think with the agreement, I think it's taken us only so far. Um, I think, you know, it doesn't tackle sectarianism. You know, I, I don't think we're it, it's done enough to tackle sectarianism within our own communities. Um, I think it prioritizes civility in some cases over actually challenging historical wrongs and actually addressing issues that we have with each other. Um, I, I don't think the agreement is good at addressing victims' needs. It mentions that victims should be participants in life, but I, I know many, some victims definitely have said that they have felt very forgotten and abandoned over the past 25 years. And now we have, you know, the British government is going to pass this 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 bill that is going to basically grant an amnesty to um, soldiers, provisional IRA members, Lordis paramilitary members. Um, you know, I, I think, I find that very frustrating. You know, I, I think that, you know, that that's that the past is a huge gaping hole in Northern Ireland, and I just don't think the agreement has sufficiently addressed that. Um, I think a lot of it hasn't been implemented. Um, the civic forum um, was one thing in the Good Friday Agreements. This was a forum that was proposed that civic society could feed into the institutions to, to influence policy making. That has never really been done. And I think that would have made a massive difference. Um, some of the rights provisions, you know, Bill of Rights, we're still waiting for that. You know, that's something I think really would help everyone if we had our own. Bill of Rights that could address the needs of, of different communities in Northern Ireland. So, I, I, you know, I, I think it, it does have a, quite a lot of limitations. You know, I think you know we're we're very, you know, I feel very grateful that that my family voted for it and that we that the majority of Northern Ireland voted for it. But um, 
you know, I'm at the stage where I think, you know, we need more than this. You know, I think the, the economic system that's been implemented in Northern Ireland since the agreement, I think, hasn't really delivered for a lot of people. And a lot of people have been left behind by it. And a lot of communities are still living with a legacy of it. And other communities have been able to move on in a way. Um, so I, I think at this at this 25 year anniversary, really, I've been kind of talking a lot more about that because I feel so frustrated. And, you know, the assembly's down. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's a deeply flawed document. As much as I think, you know, I'm very glad that it's there. Yes, um, and I think you know the things you're talking about, Sarah. I mean, this our debate here is is around um, you know the constitutional issue, um, the possibility of a referendum where people decide, um, but and this whole constitutional conversation. But if all of those things have been there that you've just talked about, it might have equipped us better to have this constitutional debate. You know, that is, you know, you're certainly pointing out the weaknesses there. And and Colin, what you've pointed out so clearly as well is the absence of, um, I suppose, the information that would e equip people to say, OK, you know, it's in the agreement. This is what then lets us know whenever a referendum might be triggered. and then. Um, that raises uncertainty. I'm thinking, Sarah, here of um, a talk. You and I shared a platform in last year's Fail and Fubba, and we were responding to a piece of research that had been done in women's groups across the island about their hopes and fears uh, around the um, a forthcoming referendum and the constitutional issue. And uh, the women were who responded were much more able to uh, express their fears and their fears were often located in the absence of clarity and just like a real desire to know what would be a process, just a real desire for knowledge. And that's something that I've heard you um, address, you know, to do many addresses about, Colin, about how this kind of information could empower us a lot more to have um, a constitutional conversation in a way that we can manage and you know that there will, there will be strong views on on either side and you know people who uh, don't have strong views as well but you know there's something about the opportunity to have this kind of uh, constitutional conversation could be better than it is now if the information was there so just respond on that point Colin yeah, I, look, I'm a just generally, I, I just prefer to, to face into things and uh, plan and manage them rather than they counterintuitively. I think we, we don't deal with the constitutional question here. We, we, people, I rev, rather reverse what people usually think. I think we, have, we avoid dealing with it and dealing with it would mean having clarity about a lot of these questions. I think that if, if, if the choice is there, uh, as it is in the agreement, and it's anticipated, and certainly in a post-Brexit context, I, my preference would be to have a very well-managed uh, process towards giving people a choice to, to actually address it, rather than uh, pretend that we are addressing it or not addressing it. So, you know, I'm I would, you know, I've argued for a time frame for an intergovernmentally managed uh, process with substantial civic involvement and input, because. You know, I was going to, you know, I, I, I just as somebody who lives here, I just wanted to be asked the question. I just don't want it always to be a question. I would like to answer it, um, but I'd like to answer it and know what I'm voting for or against. I would like to be, uh, know the consequences of it. And I think that sounds banal and simple. I'm not trying to simplify a difficult problem, but I, I, I want to rule against the stereotype of Northern Ireland, the North, you know, I, I, I think we don't actually deal with these questions well. We don't handle them well. We don't manage them well. We don't have enough participation and input into them. Um, but ultimately, yeah, like I'm a big, big believer. Anybody who knows me, any, anybody I've ever supervised this, well, I'm a structurally obsessed person. I, I just believe in, in structure, planning, process, knowing what things are about and not avoiding things. And actually at the moment, even if I wasn't where I was in the civic debate and had my own views, I think the lack of uncertainty, uncertainty now is edging into destabilizing here. Uh, 
you know, there's so much talk about this. There's just a book a week appearing on it, you know, every day you wake up. And it's just at some point we're going to have to ask the question and just get ready for asking it, as well as do other things too. You know, I don't think this has to consume life. I think this can be taken forward as well as other things too. But yeah, it's really just, that's a very long way of agreeing with you. Well, and just to kind of build on that a wee bit more, Colin, um, you know, because you're someone who is advocating for a, a referendum, who has a position on it in terms of uh, reunification and has very much participated in some of the debates that have increasingly started to happen. So um, how do you think, how do you trace, you know, how that campaign has been developing over the last number of years? And you can certainly refer to Brexit. Yeah, I just want to start by um, just a, a small defence of myself and Sarah. As is it this? You can you can keep me right, sir. If I'm I'm saying anything, I shouldn't be here. But we've both been fairly open about where we are in these constitutional discussions and what what our preferences are. And you know, I think that's important. That people are that I, you know, the idea that there's all these people out there who don't have a view when they actually do have a view, you know, but they keep it, you know, wh whether it's free expression, whether it's the rights and the agreement, however you want to put it, you know, we should be able to articulate a constitutional preference, either pro union or pro unity, and and just get on <laughs> with life, you know, like nobody should be excluded from anything in this society for being pro union or pro unity. You know, let me put that on the, and nobody should be labelled, you know, which we either side frequently are for for actually being open and honest about about where we are. So let me get that let let me get that out there to start. Um, where are things at at the moment? Very good question. Um, uh, audience can probably tell more than me, but Brexit personally, Brexit was a big factor. Uh, for me personally, I just it 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 was decisive in my own decisions to do what I've done the last few years. I just think after Brexit, faced with the EU return option as well, I just like I'm this is probably me, right? And it's probably sort of academic. -y. It just it just seems odd and and slightly bizarre not to talk about it after Brexit and after the absolute horlicks that has been made of Brexit. When I look oh, at just what one the, moment, yeah, um, yeah. could you just explain for people because you've yeah. said there the yeah. EU return yeah. option? Yeah. Just explain that a wee bit for people for our audience. Well, April 2017, although the EU could do more to to flesh this out, has said that Northern Ireland is an automatic way back to the European Union if it votes for constitutional change within the terms of the Good Friday Agreement using the German sort of technical precedent. I just think that's a you know an external border of the EU being on the island of Ireland as a is a new factor in that conversation. Added to that, uh, the 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 repellent toxicity of the politics emanating from Westminster just, is, I think, it's against the values of many people across the society, not just you know people who've traditionally supported constitutional change. I suppose to categorise where the campaign is, like I'm, like I've made no secret where I am and all this. I'm very open about where I am and what I'm involved in, what I'm trying to do, and trying to learn lessons as I go through this process. I think phase one, and you can read this in the Ireland's Future documentation and other documentation, was essentially to normalise the discussion, to, to put it centrally in public life, to mainstream it, affirm its legitimacy, encourage discussions, you know, encourage serious academic reflection on the process, you know, to, to just make this a, a normal mainstream everyday conversation as agreement anticipated. And I think, you know, even the harshest critics of what we're doing would find it hard to totally reject that. I think that element of it has moved. It's become a much more prominent conversation. And I suppose the next phase of that, which is the harder phase, is really a pathway towards a referendum. What will be proposed? You know, when you turn up on people's doorsteps, campaigning for constitutional change or on the pro-union side, you know, what are you going to say? What's the literature going to include? You know, so I think the first phase, mainstream, normalize, make this uh, everyday topic of conversation in public life on the island of Ireland and civic spaces as well. I think that's largely been successful in terms of that element of the campaign, um, although there's more work to do on that. Um, the second phase now, which I think is a challenging phase, is a pathway towards a referendum. 
and what will actually be in the prospectus. You know, people quite, we have polls here every week, right? And there's, and the polls will be asking people, would you vote for United Ireland tomorrow? Nobody can tell you what United Ireland tomorrow is actually going to look like, you know what I mean? So it's, you know, there, if it's not going to be an absorption model, if it's going to be New Ireland, you know, there needs to be a lot of work done as to what's prospectus. I want to know what I'm voting for. Yeah. Like I'm fairly clear where I probably will vote, right? But I would like to know the details, as would many people here. So um, I think the discussion's in a better place than it was. But in terms of the context, Brexit, like Brexit has just had a transformative impact, I think, here on this discussion. But that's just my own take on it. Yeah. And Sarah, I suppose looking at this then from a unionist perspective, um, and you know having that insight that you also have into the unionist community, it does feel to me that unionism has been slower to actually make the case for the union, um, in terms of taking part in this debate. And why do you think that is? Yeah. And would you agree? And why do you think it is? I think I think unionism has been been slow to make the case for union, and I, I, I if there's multi, there's different elements to this. I think first of all, just I would say that like unionism has never had to sell the union. You know, Northern Ireland was designed with an inbuilt Protestant majority. You know, it was expected that last that would last forever, and there was no question that you know if you if you had any type of poll and they if they had a referendum in 1973, obviously that was boycotted, and whether it was legitimate or not is a whole different question. But people voted for it. There was always this confidence that the unionism would have no problem um, getting public support for it. Um, it was also just the, the troubles as well. You know, I I think people need to understand. You know. You know, I remember my I remember my family explaining to me. You know, when during the troubles, he just said, you know, the South was a very Catholic country. It didn't have divorce. You know, didn't have abortion rights. You know, obviously Northern Ireland was very conservative, but Britain was much more more forward thinking. And um, it was very poor at the time. You know, and, and the IRA were were blowing up and killing people. And you know, there was no no unionists would have had any trouble. They didn't have to sell the union. They just had to point at the Republic and say. Do you want this? <laughs> and most people would have said no. Um, but as Colin says, you know, Brexit really has changed things. Now, I don't, I don't believe, you know, that we're on a trajectory towards United Ireland. I don't believe that there's a big rush towards United Ireland. But absolutely, Brexit has changed, has shifted the ground. I think, I think it has made people think about this issue, particularly the younger generation. People think about this issue a lot. You know. Um, friends of mine just say you know up until Brexit they were very very happy very content and then Brexit happened and they went oh what type of country do I want to live in where do you know am I actually quite happy in the union and, and you know some friends of mine who were very apolitical now are quite political it has had a huge impact on people and I think unionism really hasn't it's taken unionism quite a while to catch up with this you know for many reasons one of course that many unionists voted for Brexit you know majority of Unionists voted for Brexit, 30% voted Remain, including myself. Um, but some of my members of my family voted Leave. And, you know, the Leave vote is quite complex. You know, um, people in my family voted Leave because they were socialists. They've hated the European Union <laughs> since the 1970s. Um, others voted for much more, slightly more conservative reasons. Um, I believe the Brexit vote was in part about a backlash against globalisation. You know, there's there's all these different elements to the vote as to reasons why unionists voted for that. But for some people, it was very much about reasserting their unionism and connecting with the rest of the union. And I think, you know, unionism supported the, it lost the referendum in Northern Ireland, but it won the UK wide vote. And then the DUP really became the voice of, because it was the largest unionist party, really became the voice of mainstream unionism and then proceeded to back a hard Brexit, which <laughs> has led us to really where we are now, which is, has has led to the Northern Ireland Protocol and everything else. Um, and I think I think some unionists, not all of them, I, some unionists were very sharp a lot. Some unionists, um, like uh, Mike Nesbitt, for instance, said before the referendum, don't vote for this. This is going to be a disaster. You know, the Ulster Unionist Party, to its credit, supported Remain, said this is going to be ridiculous. We don't want to do this. Um, some unionists have come out recently and said it was a really stupid decision. But I, I just think they've been slow to, to recognise what's been going on because some unionists just, you know, they 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 really are quite convinced that United Ireland could never, ha it will never happen because I think 
they were part of that generation that grew up, as I was talking about during the troubles, where it was just unthinkable. They just, this is just bonkers. Nobody could vote for this. And they're, some of them um, are a bit detached from young people. They're a bit detached from other communities and conversations that are happening. And they just, I just don't think they realized that it would have such an impact. I think people thought it was pie in the sky. They just thought this, this, this will be fine, which is amazing to think about when you consider everything that has happened since that vote. But um, I, I, I just, I don't think unionism has been as organized. And I think that's just a feature of unionism because unionism is so divided. Um, naturally, you know, there are so many different sections of unionism. Um, everybody disagrees about everything, really. Um, you know, it's very hard for people to come together and, and be coherent about these things. So I, I think it has taken unionism a long time to figure out, oh, actually, we're going to have to, if this is going to happen, if a border poll is going to happen, I think most people would would say, will tell you, they think, one, it's going to happen at some point. Um, I still think it's a wee bit away, but if it's going to happen at some point, people are starting to think, how are we going to sell this? Um, I don't think unionism is as organized as as the unity camp, I, I, nowhere near as well organized as the unity camp. Um, so I, I think it's for multiple different reasons. I say some of it, I think it's historical, but I just, I think some unionists really just, just took their eyes off the ball, really. Mm, that's fascinating. I'm going to turn now um, to looking at some of the questions because I want to make sure that we can um, answer them. And that'll probably lead our discussion a wee bit as well. The first question was from Ed McCann, who, who was asking, what are the circumstances under which a border poll will take place now? That question was asked at the very beginning. I think we have kind of covered it, but, you know, recognising that actually it's meant to be whenever, you know, the Secretary of State decides, you know, that there, there will be a majority. So that has been left very unclear. And that is part of some of the campaigning that there is at the minute is to say, define, you know, let's define this more clearly. Um, and another question for me, will the, and this is a, a, is one that I have thought about often as well, and that has come up in various discussions um, also. Will the unionist loyalist communities accept a border poll or referendum, um, accept that a border poll result peacefully in favour of a new United Ireland, given the current problems over the protocol. Um, just to rephrase that, and with the emphasis that was meant, will the unionist loyalist communities accept a border poll result peacefully mm -hmm. in favour of a new United Ireland? Should I, I tackle that one then? I mean, I, yeah, I start I, with you I, and then, yeah, yeah. But I want you both to answer it. Yeah. I think for the most part, yes. You know, I, I think most people most people are Democrats. They accept that if, if, if you lose, you lose, you know, that's it. You know, if, if we all signed up to this process, if, if the, the border poll question is called, that's what happens. I think most people will find it very difficult. I think it will be very challenging for a lot of people, uh, but I think they will accept it. But I, I don't think we should downplay the fact that some people will not. Um, I, I do think there will be some people will want to turn to violence or threaten violence. I think some people, it, it will be so angry about it and furious about it. I, I do think some of them will not accept it. Um, you know, one of the concerns that I have at the moment is I think there is a pushback against the Good Friday Agreement itself, which is a whole other different topic. You know, there's some polls show that some unionists wouldn't vote for the Good Friday Agreement at the moment. And again, that's a separate topic. Some of that I can understand, some of it I can't. But I think there are elements of unionism. I, I think they're a minority, to be honest, but I, I think some of them have power, more power than they really should have. Um, and I think they are preparing to lay the groundwork to deny the legitimacy of a border poll. I, I think that I talked about the 1973 referendum. I think some people will boycott a border poll if it, it it depends on the circumstances to be honest with you i think if the border if they think of the opinion polls show that it's going to go through by 70 80 percent you know but if it's going to be tight I, I think some people will boycott it um because we talked about the the lack of clarity in the agreement you know i think if the secretary of state was to call a border poll under dubious circumstances i think some people would say it's not a legitimate poll it's not being called properly you know there there are still some unionists and loyalists, again, I think they're they're in the minority, but they they just they cannot accept that that 
that Northern Ireland now has to leave the union. If it's going to leave union, it will leave by consent, basically. So for the most part, yeah, that's a, it's a long way of saying yes and no, <laughs> essentially. But um, I, I do think that is a worry. I don't think it's discussed enough as it is um, going forward. I, I do think it's downplayed just how challenging it will be. But the circumstances at the time, I think, are going to determine what happens next. You see, I do think I, it is um, it's very valuable, Sarah, to hear you speak so clearly about that, because I think it is one of the things that we don't talk enough about. And um, already, as you know, you referred earlier on to the fact the amount of uh, threats and abuse, for example, Colin, that you have received and, you know, that being part of the discourse, but then our history, in a sense, um, is raising this as an issue for us as well. In that research that I talked about earlier that you and I both are responding to, the women did express, the fears that were expressed were about a return to violence. And that was coming from, um, I think, a fear from uh, loyalism. And I wonder how we are to manage this. And maybe part of it is about naming it. Um, Colin, do you want to come in on this? Because I know I've heard you talk about this before also. Well, it you know, we have plenty of experience on the island of Ireland uh, to learn from uh, in terms of how not to do things. Um, you know, it would be naive, given the history of the island and actually relationships between these islands, if uh, we were to completely discount the fact that people may use force for political power. You know, there's a long running history on all sides of the argument around this. You know, the hope is that the values of the agreement around peaceful and democratic means will frame the conversation. I agree with Sarah, I think largely people will accept. But, you know, in this society and given the context, you can't rule uh, a resort to, to, to force out to be candid. I think that's the history of the island in many respects on all, all sides of the constitutional question. So the question is what you're asking is how can we minimize it? I, I do think that's where management, lesson learning from elsewhere and from our own history as to what works in terms of minimizing the potential for conflict. I was recently asked this question by somebody and they posed it around, you know, you know, increased expenditure on the Irish Defence Forces in, t in terms of, you know, issues around counterinsurgency. And like, I'm a human rights advocate, you know, that's not where I want to start a conversation about the future of the island, about, you know, the potential for resisting a counterinsurgency in Northern Ireland, I guess, you know, I think because ultimately what we've seen here is that militarized solutions don't work, you know, so uh, let's start from a different framework. So there's two frameworks for me. One in particular is around socioeconomic equality. Like all the evidence suggests about the communities that are most likely uh, to be involved, if you like, uh, in these uh, you know approaches. So I think one lesson for me is that socioeconomic equality needs to be a central part of the discussion. You know, hard look at our education system here, a hard look at marginalized, disadvantaged communities, returning to old concepts like targeting social need and objective need and things like that of, the, you know, without resorting to cliches, you know, widely used in politics, which I'm not, you know, not leaving people behind. Uh, if the communities are being left out, you know, what I find frustrating is that the diversity I experience in everyday life, living and working in Belfast, I don't see in the institutions around me. You know, I, I don't, I see people who are marginalized, vulnerable and left behind. And I think you're just creating the, the ground for a resurgence in the future. So that's one, to me, start socioeconomic equality. Don't start from a framework of so militarized defense approach to this, although, you know, that 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 obviously is a debate, and the other thing I'm going to put this out there, slightly pushing this a bit, but maybe provocative to some people. I see the cultures of violence on the island, cultures of militarism, and esteem accorded to militarism, and I watch people sort of parading around, and and. I put, you know, in terms of contemporary and future based around loyalism and unionism, I wonder, right, just let me put this out there, slightly provocative question. 
are some people parading around teenagers in bands around Northern Ireland in 2023? Are they the future participants in what we're talking about here? I want to pose that very, very starkly, right? And, and how that is being funded, cultures around that, what we're promoting, what we're rewarding, what we're telling young men and women to value. And, you know, the history of the island of Ireland, well, there's experience of children, young people, women, sort of toxic cultures of masculinity, toxic cultures of violence that uh, we need to deal with. So that's a very, very long way of not answering your question very well. But we need to face into socioeconomic inequality. And we need to face into the fact that, um, you know, I, I was born a bit older than Sarah in 1970. That, you know, the island of Ireland these days, the cultures of violence were everywhere. And I think we need to think about that. And we're, we're discovering, we have discovered in recent decades, you know, the extent of that in Ireland, North and South. And I think we don't face into that. We're storing up problems for the future, for young men, young women. Whatever. And that's why I want to frame the conversation. You know, I'm not interested in military solutions to any of this. So. Sarah, do you want to add anything in that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the prospect of violence if there's a border poll, I think, is a huge concern. As you said, it, it, in that research that, that that we were on that panel talking about, you know, the women mentioned that it, it is a concern. Um, I think even for people who will vote yes in a border poll, to I mean, yes for United Ireland, um, I think it will be a massive concern. I think it will be a concern in the Republic as well as to what the consequences will be. Um, you know, with the cultures of violence and stuff, you know, I... I you know, I feel ill-equipped to really talk about it because, you know, I come from a middle-class family. I didn't live through the conflict. I, I, I feel ill-equipped to address that. I, I, I do definitely think that the economic system that we have in Northern Ireland, um, the neoliberal economic policies that have been implemented since 1998, and, and policies that have been in the UK since the 1980s, really, I think, have left many communities in a very bad way. And I don't think, I don't think we should be surprised in any way that some young people are. are are involved with certain groups and doing certain things and I think you know it, it's a whole other topic in question but I, absolutely I think on this topic in particular you know I, I think at some point there will be a debate about I think some loyalist unionists are going to ask for the right to go back <laughs> to Britain I think that um so what I mean by that is I think some some unionists and loyalists are going to ask for Northern Ireland to have the right to vote again to go back to Britain. So they're going to say, you know, the Good Friday Agreement talks about the aspirations of both communities and um, give us the right to go back. And I think it will be put forward that this allowing unionists and artists to do this will temper any any talk of violence because people will be able to say you have a democratic right. And um, I think it's a whole different conversation about the practicalities of that. I'm not entirely sure whether I well, how I feel about that myself, because I just think, you know, was Northern Ireland supposed to ping back and forth between Britain and the Republic for the rest of time? You know, it, it's just it, practically I don't I don't think it's possible, but I, I think that is going to be asked for. And, you know, I've I've read if not for it to be honest, it's not hasn't been in a lot of literature. And to be honest, at the moment with my baby, I don't read a lot at the moment anyway. But um, I have seen some loyalists and unionists say that that is something that they would ask for in a conversation conversation. And I think that this topic around violence I think that is where that is how that topic is going to come forward because I think it's going to be offered as a pa as a way to temper it going forward so it's, it's a really interesting topic. It is and that I suppose brings me to think about as well and you raised this at the beginning uh, Con, what are the responsibilities of both governments um, around this and I suppose because in other parts of this conversation, we've been talking about, um, you know, the role of uh, the United States government as, you know, the role that they played in the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Do Does the United States have a role here as well? But concentrating both or initially on the role of the British and Irish governments, what role should they be playing right now? Bearing in mind this conversation, we've just had about how this can happen peacefully. 
Well, just want to follow up something Sarah said, which I think is important, you know, discussion is that it is like it's clear that there are elements, particularly in political unionism, that that are, are targeting the core constitutional framework of the agreement. And that's why I, I tried to frame the discussion this evening around compromise. Like what worries me really greatly is people forgetting how much 98 was a compromise the other way, you know, and and, and I, that really worries me intensely that, and, and I suppose the concern is that what is being attempted is to place a unionist veto right at the heart of that process and to reopen it. And that has the potential to unravel the whole thing. I think that just um, that 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 worries me a lot, and it's being put out there by people who I don't think have a lot of institutional memory of the nineties, um, or and actually don't have a lot of institutional memory of how grim and awful the conflict here was. Like, you know, like I've said this year, if one person is alive tonight because of that agreement, then the whole thing, everything was worth it. Is my 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 clear view on that. You know, it was horrible and grim and the, you know, and, and so we need to be protective of that. What's also clear is that the constitutional issue section very, very clearly was really negotiated largely by both governments and both governments have a responsibility to frame this. And I hope tonight I've made clear, I'm just a believe in normalizing it. Like I would have it on the agenda of the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference. I would try and make it a, a more normal part of intergovernmental dialogue and discussion. So the things that we've identified this evening as uh, unclear are clarified so that whenever it does happen, that can be whenever and people have different time frames around it, that people have a clearer sense of, you know, even who's going to have a vote in Northern Ireland when it actually happens, you know, things like that, that we could, could things where people agree as well on procedure, just get that all out of the way. On the international role, just very briefly on that, with my slightly sort of advocacy hat on, um, you know, to be candid, as much as I, you know, admire and respect lawyers, it's going to be politics that determines when this happens. And to me, an Irish government, which isn't, it isn't unlikely that there might be an Irish government in the next few years putting this front and centre of their uh, political project, uh, programme for government. And I just wonder how that impacts. Uh, how that impacts when Washington rings Dublin and asks, what should we do on this? When the EU asks Dublin and they're getting different answers from Dublin than they're getting now. Um, and I just put that out there. I wonder. I think that's a different conversation. And the pressure on London to, to adopt some kind of framework, I think, may come from that amalgamation that we've seen form around some of the Brexit discussions as well. But really, we're talking about pressure to clarify and deal with uncertainty around something that's already um, there. I don't think there's a great desire to rush into anything without us really knowing very much about what people are, are voting for. But I'm just I'm ending really by putting out there that in the next two years, there could be new governments in London and Dublin. And I wonder how that impacts on what we're talking about this evening. And you know, a big theme of the debate is, are we ready for that? Are we prepared? You know, uh, because things don't just always go in a smooth arc, of, as we know from the last decade. Um, so that's why there's a certain urgency about just getting prepared and ready, I think. Sarah, anything about that? that yeah, I, I think the, the role of the British Irish government's um, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question topic. I mean, it looks like Sinn Fein are going to eventually at some point be the government in the south and potentially be in government once the assembly comes back in Northern Ireland as well. Um, that I think will have a huge implications for this topic. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think the Irish government the Irish government it's out of it's out of unionist hands. Really, the Irish government will do what it wants to do. You know, if Marilyn Macdonald wants to put this front and center, she's going to put it front and center. Um, they're going to talk about it 
it's Sinn Féin. <laughs> Come on. You know, I think if they weren't talking about it, we'd all be like, are you OK, guys? Come on. You know, um, you know, I think if, if the Irish government um, under Sinn Féin really wants to take things further, you know, we have the shared island unit. I, I do think that will change a bit if that's still in place. Um, I think it will probably start to change more. I'll lay over Agra's the T-shirt now, and I think that will change going forward. I think Marilyn McDonald will use it in a very, very different way. I, you know, I think unionists are just going to have to get on with it, just going to have to focus on the, the question at hand, which is, you know, <laughs> making Northern Ireland a livable best place to live, making the union a good place to live. Um, so I, I I think the Irish government, I do think there probably will be some more pressure coming in on the British government. I think Holland mentioned from America, the European Union possibly, I, you know, I think... Sinn Féin will use its soft power to lobby. It has great international connections overseas. And I think that will have a significant impact. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is up to the Secretary of State to call whether a border poll is called in Northern Ireland. Um, and I don't think the Secretaries of State, whoever it is, whether it's Labour or Tory, I don't think are going to be pushed into this really. Um, you know, under the Northern Ireland Act, the, the Secretary of State, the Northern Ireland Act 1998, which implements the Good Friday Agreement um, into law, you know, that the Secretary of State can call a border poll um, at their discretion. So they can call a border poll at any time. And they there's a mandatory poll, so they have to call a poll when uh, it looks like a, a United Ireland is likely, which, as we've discussed, is really quite open-ended. But I think there's there's clearly some obvious circumstances where you could see that that, that, that clause would come into action. Um. You know, I, I don't think a Secretary of State is going to be calling a discretionary poll at any point. I think particularly at the moment with Scotland looking like it's potentially could vote for independence in a referendum at this point in time. I don't think any I don't think Keir Starmer, who's the Labour leader, I don't think of the Tories um, will be willing to do that um, at this point because Brexit is going very badly. And I don't think that um, they calling border polls if they call a border poll for Northern Ireland Scotland's going to want one too and the last thing they want for project Brexit is for the union to collapse <laughs> completely particularly with Scotland going and um, I think in terms of border poll the question of the British government is really interesting and um, some people think the British government shouldn't have a role in any referendum I, I don't think that's that's correct I think it's up to the British government to decide what role it will take and um, I, I think the British government if it wants to be pro-union should be actively um, supporting the union in any border poll, but obviously, you know, if the prime minister is somebody like Boris Johnson, they should stay out of it completely. Do not come near us. <laughs> stay away. Lock him in a cupboard. Don't let him out. Um, you know, but I think in reality, I think I, I could see the Conservatives taking a more pro-union position. The Conservatives being more active and willing to participate in border poll. I think with Labour, because Labour has a long history of. Uh, its sister party is the SDLP, obviously, which is, is for United Ireland. I could see the Labour Party being more free vote in the sense that the British government might stay out of it, but MPs might be more involved in the campaign. Um, so I, I think it's really going to depend on the government at the time of what the position will take. You know, I think if it looks as though United Ireland is going to pass in any case, to just say it's like 70, 80 percent, as I say, 60 percent, it's going to pass. I don't think the British government's going to go too hard on that. Um, and I think that that will be a concern for unionists, I think, because obviously unionists will, they don't have as many international connections as nationalists and Republicans. They will want backup and support, I think, from overseas, from as many places as they can get. So I, I think that is often a worry for unionists. Some unionists will often wonder out loud, you know, if, if this this border poll is called, if this border poll is called, you know, is anybody actually going to go show up and back us up? I do think some people from Britain will come over, but I, I think the question of the British government is very interesting. And I do think the British government has to be very careful in how it manages if a referendum is called, because as I said, if, if, a, if a referendum is called in very dubious circumstances, it potentially means disaster further down the line. I, I think it gives people an opportunity to reject the vote and not accept it. Um, Colin, you have mentioned this a bit as well. You, you mentioned this at the very beginning, uh, the possibility of, um, you know, enshrining in law a potential, you know, or creating, creating a new barrier um, or creating a new comfort zone for uh, unionism to be introduced in law as a way of getting unionism to accept uh, the Windsor framework, the latest agreement between the EU and the UK about trading, which, you know, uh, still means that there is uh, friction, you know, between Northern Ireland and the UK. So just can you come back to that point that you mentioned at the very beginning and your fears around that? 
again, good question. And starting point is that unionism and loyalism isn't mon monolithic and really essentially just to, to fine tune that question, it's, the, it's around the DUP really, trying to persuade the DUP to essentially do their jobs, you know, and get back into a partial government in the midst of our uh, socioeconomic crisis here. Um, you know, and th there was never really any good reason for boycotting the institutions anyway, but we don't want to revisit all that. So it's, so unionism and loyalism, there are many voices in unionism and loyalism, it's not a monolith, and, and, but the DUP position, it's it, it's the risk that people with very, very short memories put things on the table that that unravel big things here, you know, and it just worries me when people talk about the constitutional issues section of the agreement. If you look at it with a legal lens, it, it is quite precise. It's so precise, in fact, that both governments put their legal text in the document. Um, so it was clearly intended to to be something that brought precision and precise legal language with it. And I, I just, I'm, I'm putting a, a word of caution out there, particularly for the Westminster government, even a sort of, you know, meaningless declaratory form of words that that they might come up with to try and is risky right I, I just mean it's, that, that section is was you know torturously worked out <laughs> i just think the idea of throwing something in to try and, and just saying well it doesn't really count is uh worries me um but we're yet to see i don't know maybe others have but i haven't seen anything that looks like a draft clause or anything like that in terms of what they're promising and of course they've not now what they've done is they've held out the offer of doing something so people are sort of waiting to 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 see what they're going to do. So so that's the worry. That's really a framing for the discussion tonight from my you know my own perspective that 98 was a compromise that's often forgotten. And that we open that all up now, I think please don't would be my uh ask in terms of this evening. And that's what 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 I meant uh, I think. Yeah. Um I suppose, I mean, we've touched on this already, but, and, and we've touched on it a lot really around what are the challenges going ahead? And we've talked about, I had asked you to think earlier, you know, whenever we were talking just before we started, what are the challenges for all of us as a society? Because um, although we, we have here, you know, around this table that we're sharing at the minute, you know, different views on what we would like as a constitutional future. Um, but but what unites all of us is, um, you know, that commitment to human rights, that commitment to social justice. So it's one process that really um, speaks to those values as well. So I think we have talked about what are, are going to be the challenges for all of us going forward. but. I'd like you, you know, honing in on each of your kind of constitutional, you know, the positions that you would be advocating. What are the challenges? I mean, you've set out the phases, Colin, but what are the challenges you would see immediately for uh, the for those advocating for a referendum and for reunification? Um, I think that. Just just a few things to to put out there, and it, it crosses either side of the the argument. Really, I think some some people just don't like the idea of a referendum, you know, and but but just won't quite say that um, because they're worried about what a referendum might uh, mean in in Northern Ireland. Um, so on the pre pro unity side, what I mean by that is there's this sort of abstract metaphysical approach to the agreement that seems to imply that the border will somehow melt away in some mysterious process of engagement in the institutions, that isn't going to happen, right? That th there, has, there has to be a vote at some point around it. And I, I think that's an interesting tension you see in the pro-unity debate, the sort of melting away versus facing into a referendum. And part of that is I think people are nervous about what a referendum might mean here. Of course, in the South of Ireland, where there's a much more well-established referendum culture, there's less sort of debate, debate discussion around that, I think. But people are worried about the northern component of it. I think that creating spaces that allow 
transformative pro-union and pro-unity voices to be heard and listened to is important. So I don't just, that's not just a challenge for the pro-unity debate, it's a challenge for the pro-union debate as well. Let me be very clear. If the pro-union proposition in Northern Ireland is the status quo, then it isn't a very appealing proposition, right? But I suspect for, for Sarah and for many others who, who, who have a pro-union position that that's not their view. So what, what I'm trying to say is the most intriguing aspects of conversation are going to happen within both camps if you want to reduce it to that sort of binary, right? So, so on, the, on the United Ireland side, people use the language of a new Ireland. What do they mean by New Ireland? Uh, how transformative is that going to be? Who, who, who wins those arguments? Now, Irish history tells us something about, historically, who has often won those arguments in Irish history. Who's going to win those arguments in the future? As somebody, personally, who works in the area of equality, rights, and social justice, I sort of take the new bit really, really seriously. <laughs> you know, um, I don't think the South is a sort of paradise that's waiting to, I think there are many, many challenges there, as with the North. And I also see that in the pro-union side, you know, what's the proposition going to be? Like Sarah mentioned there about locking Boris in a cupboard, you know, which, you know, appealing prospect, uh, you know, but, but ultimately I think that comes from a space of who's going to be advocating for the pro-union side. Now, you know, obviously if the pro-unity side got to choose who advocated for the pro-union side, they might have, but, but who are going to be the best advocates? And I think ultimately, if the starting point is persuasion, like many years ago, I said something rather foolish that I thought we'd be all be better off for having the discussion. And part of that was because I want the best arguments on the table. I, I don't want to be arguing against straw arguments. I don't want to be in discussions with caricatures or sort of extremist fringe arguments that do not do no justice to unionist or loyalist arguments, which are complex and not monolithic in any way whatsoever. I want this to be a good debate based an honest debate based on facts and evidence and hope about the future so that whatever happens at the far end of it, whether my argument wins or, or loses, we're in a better space afterwards. And I circle back to marginalized and vulnerable people like in, in the pro-unity side, you know, I that's important to me. It's important that that this isn't, you know, a status quo. Uh, United Ireland or a New Ireland that the new bit is meaningful and particularly with people who really need some of this rhetoric to, to, to matter. So I, I hope that's the way in which it will be conducted going forward, but I'm nervous and I'm worried about how it might unfold in reality. So. Mm. But what you hold out there, Colin, is uh, you know, the promise of a very really participative and vigorous discussion. And I'm reminded there um, of some people I know, you know, who at the time the Scottish referendum was taking place, the way that galvanised participative uh, politics in Scotland and people talked about whole areas that they hadn't talked about before and that um, on both, you know, the independence and union side and, you know, held out visions for the future. It feels like that's what you're talking about. Sarah, well, just I to, Claire, you maybe just to share a, some of that, but cut, yes. Uh, come in, just, a, a, just a final observation on that. Like in all these debates, children and young people are absent. You know, the voices of yes. children and young people are are largely, I, I don't see enough engagement. Um, I, I don't see enough engagement for, for many groups across society, but that, that worries me because people, children and young people are going to have to live in the futures that we're talking about. So I just yes. wanted to say that. Sarah. Yeah. And the, the challenges, I mean, oh gosh, I could talk for, for hours about the challenges based on the union's position. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, I, I think, um, I think the challenge for both really is I think we need to make sure that we don't make things worse in this process um of, of talking about these things um you know many unionists feel very the conversation really down you know I, I think people should be like you know let them discuss whatever they want you know they don't need permission from anybody to talk about this i've said this before but you know many unionists often feel pressurized and talking about a united ireland they often feel that they're 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 being they're told you know turn up and tell us what you would like in a united ireland and if you don't you know we'll, we'll design a united ireland that's terrible for you you know they they some unionists feel like you know these conversations are happening and they don't want to have anything to do with them you know um you know i 
from some unionist perspective, you know, I, I don't agree and I agree with them. You know, I don't think we're on a trajectory towards United Ireland. I don't think it's it's happening. I've said this before. I think I think we're in a moment and I think we're in a very interesting place. And I think ultimately who whoever utilizes this moment effectively, I think could be very successful. Um, and I I don't think unionists are utilizing this moment very effectively, which is my concern. Um, but I, I don't think unionists need to have constitutional conversations about the United Ireland because I think they, there's a risk that they're going to add to this idea that it is happening. I, I think it, it, it's, and I think they find that very frustrating. And I, and equally with the pro union side, you know, there, there's this this attitude of, oh well, United Ireland just doesn't happen, so shut up. And I think that you risk antagonizing the nationalists and the Republican community, making them feel like their their concerns and their aspirations aren't valid. Um, you know, I just think we have to be so careful that we don't make the situation worse, that whatever, whether we're talking about the union, that we, we we're always coming to the perspective that we we all have to come together at some point. And I think no matter what happens, you know, Northern Ireland has to, we, we have to work in Northern Ireland. If if Northern Ireland is in a much better place, it will make living in the union easier. It will make a United Ireland a lot easier. Um, and, you know, I was talking earlier about, you know, the problems with the agreement with victims and stuff, you know, th th those problems will come into United Ireland if they're not fixed or resolved now. Um, but generally for unionism, you know, the challenges ahead, I mean, I mean, the Tories, the, the Conservative government that is sitting in London is, has just been an absolute disaster from the union. Um, every time they've been in office, you know, if you want to start with Thatcher and work your way forward from that, really, um, you know, Britain, the United Kingdom really is in a really, really difficult place. You know, we've talked a lot about Brexit this evening, but, you know, I, I think austerity, the policies of austerity that were implemented in the UK, over 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago by the coalition government, I think have decimated this country. You know, our public services are on their knees. We have winding inequality. You know, the unionist argument for such a long time was that it makes economic sense for Northern Ireland to remain in the union. And that's part of the right part of the reason why I, I am pro-union myself. Um, I've always believed that Northern Ireland was economically better off. I, I still do think that, but I, by God, I think that that argument is being made very hard to make in the present moment. Um, you know, the United Kingdom, we're going through a period of stagnation, wages are low. You know, I don't believe that the Republic is the promised land. I think the Republic of Ireland has a lot of problems with it. You can see that with the housing crisis, you can see that in the number of young people that are leaving. Um, I get very frustrated when some advocates for United Ireland and Colin doesn't do this, but would, would kind of have this idea of candy land Ireland. If we vote for United Ireland, all our problems will just go away. I, I think that's nonsense. You know, I have much more respect for people who advocate for United Ireland who want a brand, you know, basically want to burn the Republic to the ground, essentially, as someone said it to be, you know, build a whole new society and get rid of the systems that are there. Um, but, but the union, you know, selling the status quo was very difficult. It is very, very difficult to sell the status quo. I, I, I don't think it's an impossible argument to make. But it is a very going to be a very difficult argument to make. So the National Health Service was a key plank of the unionist argument because the southern government, um, the southern state has it has universal health care, but it's an insurance system. Um, you know, I, I still believe that the National Health Service is better. You know, um, when I was pregnant, I had hyperemesis. And if I'd been in the south, I would have had to pay thousands for medication. I got it for free in the National Health Service. But you know, the people I talk to today, people are paying for private health care. People are waiting years on the waiting list. Um, it is an absolute disaster, you know, and that is a key flank of the unionist argument. And I said to someone a while ago, we were talking about, you know, the benefits of the NHS and they just laughed and said, Sarah, there is no NHS. I mean, you know, how are unionists going to sell this? I don't know how they're going to. And I think the problem is, is, you know, these are obviously some of these are transient issues. The Tories won't always be in government. I think they will leave government at some point and to be replaced by Labour, who, being honest, I'm not enthusiastic about, but I'll take it. Um, I don't, I think the problem is that unionism itself, political unionism, I should I gather, because I think most unionists and loyalists on the ground are 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 much, much further ahead of their politicians. Um, I think they are, I don't see a lot of them publicly, some of them, I think obviously in private do, but they some of them seem to be going along with this. They seem to be quite happy with the status quo and seem to be quite happy with the state of the economy. They're not really advocating for better. They're not really selling a vision of Northern Ireland and the union going forward. For some of them, it just seems to be, oh, the status quo is fine. Um, that's not going to win hearts and minds. You know, I, I think for some unionists believe that they can win this on the facts. They say, if you look at the facts, we will win on that. And I, I have said to some people, but you look at Brexit, 
<laughs> you know, where, as I said, I can understand why people voted late, but you looked at the facts, you thought it would have thought Remain would have won. Everybody thought Remain was going to win and it didn't win. And the reason why it didn't win was because of emotion, because the Brexit Leave campaign was was very effective and it sold people a vision of the UK outside of the European Union. It spoke to people in problematic ways in some in, in many cases, but it, it, it sold them a vision and said, we, you could have a better future outside the European Union. You know, some unionists just don't see that. They don't see that that the unity campaign will do this, which I find amazing because a lot of them voted for Brexit. I say to them, this is this, you, you got this better than Remainers did. Um, so I think that's the challenges going forward. I did the UK government, the state of the United Kingdom economy, um, the fact that we have no assembly, the, the lack of devolved institutions, you know, you know, I understand why unionists, um, some unionists feel very passionately about the protocol. I understand why they're opposed to it, but I I cannot. I can't understand the reasons why they think crashing the assembly is going to help their case in any single way. You know, um, they're going to have to sell Northern Ireland, not just the union, because the Northern Ireland is most people's experience of the union. And I don't know how you can do that without a devolved government. And if you if people's faith in devolved government is taken away, where are they going to go? Um, and I think some of the unionist politicians, um, the idea of any of them fronting a border poll campaign, I just put my head in my hands. You know, some of the the, the foundations that have been set up to advocate for the union, <laughs> if they're in charge of a border poll, I, I, I think we're, we're screwed, quite frankly. Um, so the challenge is going, I think unionism is a very, very difficult place. I don't think it's impossible. And um, there are some very smart unionists out there who know what needs to be done, who are advocating, who are doing their best, who are organising, um, and I have a lot of respect for them, but I, I think they have a very difficult road ahead, and I think I think there, there seems to be this attitude that unionists are going to have an easy job. They're not, and I think smart unionists know that. Mm. Really interesting insights from both of you there, and I think shown as well that some of these debates that are going to be some most interesting just what you said, Colin, are the debates within, you know, the positions as well as, you know, between the positions. I think it's important to say, and just because we have talked so much about Brexit, which was, of course, uh, the UK vote to leave the European Union, but um, Northern Ireland as a region, you know, voted to stay, you know, which was another kind of a factor, I think, in terms of, uh, I'm talking about the majority of people here, voted to remain, even though there was a substantial vote to leave. But that was one of those factors of uh, feeling that um, something that was imposed, that was certainly my feeling, you know, of the strength of reaction and the, then how the, you know, how suddenly the, the constitutional question became galvanized by that, almost like it, it felt to many people here like a denial of democracy. Um, and, oh, I've just looked at the time. The last time I looked, it was, <laughs> it was, I thought we had 15 minutes to go, but uh, but we don't. We have reached the end of our time. And um, I'm just so sorry. We had one or two more questions, but um, so it was, I think it was around issues that we did cover, which was um, around, uh, you know, people uh, stirring up ill feeling, external actors around that also, the dangers of a referendum before a majority of people uh, would support the United Ireland. That would have been interesting to discuss. But I'm sorry, we have, to our audience, uh, we have run out of time. And so I just need to thank Colin, thank Sarah for that incredibly insightful and interesting um, conversation and hand back to you, Leah. Thank you. I echo that. This was incredibly interesting. I appreciate all three of you for this um, rich engagement and um, Colin and Sarah for sharing where you see eye to eye and where you see, you don't see eye to eye, but you see the, both the challenges and the opportunity for creating better conditions um, in Northern Ireland, in the North, however you frame it. Um, I, I guess I'd also like to say the fact that there are more questions and so much more to talk about, I hope that this will be a contribution to ongoing conversations and stimulate the opportunity for um, other engagements. So with that, I'd like to say a couple of words in closing. Um, let me encourage the audience, I know we can't see all of you, but to send your positive vibe and your claps for Sarah, Colin and Claire. 
And to note that today's panel ends our five-part event series. This spring, we've been celebrating and also critically examining the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And the recordings of all the events are gonna be posted soon on the website. I think all of them except for this one should be ready, I believe by tomorrow, hopefully. If you search GFA at 25 UMass, then you should be able to find the site. In closing, I wanna thank all the sponsors of the series and especially extend my sincere appreciation to my co-organizers, Michelle Gonzalez here at UMass and our Claire Hackett, who's our moderator today from the Falls Community Council, who have spent more than, uh, more, more than most of this year working with me. It's been a joy to work with you to set up this event series. And I wanna thank all the panelists <clears throat> throughout the series, including those tonight who generously shared their insights and their expertise, that we might see new angles on the tremendous achievements of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but as well shedding light on the significant implications of its gaps, ways in which there were important topics that were not included in it, or ways in which it was not successfully yet implemented. And tonight we were able to take a look at some of the possibilities within it about what might be implemented in the future. We can have no doubt that the outworkings of the agreement will continue to build a more just shared future. With that, I say thanks to all and have a very good evening.